Good afternoon. It is 301 Wednesday, January 22nd. This is the TDN Writers Room podcast. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. This is Bill Finley, and I'm going to drive Joe crazy because another baseball reference. I covered a lot of baseball in my time, and no, I am not the one who didn't vote for Derek Jeter. Jonathan Green, uh, general manager of DJ Stable, and I will not talk about baseball today. <laughs> Rather, I will give a shout out to my sister Beth, who is actually the silent B in DJ Stable. I, can't, I don't know how to follow that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Brian DiNato, uh, racing editor at the TDN and managing partner of Franklin Ave Equine. If you had a silent B, you'd be Ryan DiDonato. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, okay, good. We avoided the baseball hour right off the top, so I was worried about that. Today's news slash week in review is sponsored by West Point Thoroughbreds. Owning a racehorse with West Point Thoroughbreds can be one of the most exciting experiences of your life. Partnerships offer the thrills and gratification of the sport of kings at a fraction of the investment required to purchase and maintain an entire horse on your own. Experience for yourself why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit our website, westpointtb.com. So this broke last night. I uh, got a little email from John Green with the uh, Scooby-Doo rut row and, uh, so basically the Consumer Protection and Commerce Subcommittee in the House of Representatives is going to have a hearing on the Horse Racing Integrity Act. Um, we'll get to Bill in a second about his, uh, his, his forecast for whether that act will pass. But I just thought it was interesting that the hearing is next Tuesday at 1030 a.m. And it's going to be hosted by uh, Frank Pallone, who's actually the, the local representative here in New Jersey, as well as Jan Schakowsky. Um, I thought it was worth mentioning just because this is the feds. You know, this is not Gavin Newsom or Diane Feinstein. I know she's a senator, but this is not a localized thing in terms of in terms of uh, criticizing California racing. Let me read the quote here. Um, it says over the last couple. This is Polona and Schakowsky. Over the last couple of years, the horse racing world has experienced some alarming deaths that call, call into question the health and safety of the racehorses. We are holding this hearing to explore legislation to protect racehorses and their jockeys across the country and ensure their health and safety is top of mind for all parties involved in the sport. Uh, whether or not this actually this individual hearing has any impact or whether or not the, the bill passes, I think the fact that it is on the national radar in terms of Congress, what's been going on in racing and about the breakdowns and the fatalities, I don't know that there's a way to spin that as a good thing. And it whether, what comes of this is yet to be determined up in the air. But I just thought the, the idea that Federal, the federal government is now interested in fixing racing. Probably not a good thing. Um, I'm going to talk about why I'm sick of talking about <laughs> the Horse Racing Integrity Act. It's not going to happen. And look, I'm no expert on politics, but everything you read about it, everything you can get from reading between the lines says this thing is just not ever going anywhere. And I feel like we've been talking about this thing for like 15 years or something like that. Matter of fact, there are websites you can go to uh, that, that will give you the probability of a bill becoming a law. And remember, this is just a bill now. It, it hasn't even gotten out of uh, committee. And the probability of this becoming a law, according to uh, GovTracker, I think is the website that uh, I went to, are 2%. I mean, 2%, that's 50 to 1 uh, if you want to back this. And, you know, would it be a good thing for racing? Uh, I guess so. Um, you know, I can see it both ways. But, again, it just doesn't appear to be going anywhere. And not only that, look at the Senate. Because if this ever did get passed by the uh, Congress, the House, then you still got to deal with the Senate. And everybody and their brother says the same thing. Mitch McConnell, who runs the Senate for the Republican Party, is listening to Churchill Downs, and Churchill Downs is telling them they don't want to have anything to do with this. They don't want this to happen. And, you know, that's McConnell's job to, to look out for, you know, his constituents in a huge industry in Kentucky. And basically, the conventional wisdom is that if this ever did get to the point where it was going to advance to the Senate, McConnell was going to squash it like a bug immediately. So, you know, as long as he's in charge, as long as the Republicans control the Senate, there's still another obstacle to to this ever becoming law. So that's a long-winded uh, answer to say why we should stop talking about this damn thing. Yeah, and John, talk about it more. I'm going to talk about it more only because I'm going to quote Bill to himself, a younger Bill <laughs> to an older, more established, a little bit bigger Bill. Okay, <laughs> Basically, says, more gray hairs. in November of 2013, the HBPA said, quote, the feds are addressing a problem. And they had a 70-minute hearing conducted by the House Committee and Energy of Commerce Subcommittee, and everyone walked away kumbaya, and they thought it was going to be a wonderful thing. And they probably, it probably would have been, 
but there are bigger fish to fry with regard to Congress right now. Um, I think there's like an impeachment going on, and there's an election going on, um, and everyone's kind of scurrying to make sure that that they get reelected. That being said, it would be wonderful if the industry as a whole could get together and get behind some kind of universal, cross-the-board rules and regulations regarding medication. Because then that would be the standard. And then we could have across the board universal rules for fingerprinting and licensing. And then we could have it for nice. sales. And then we could have it for all these other things. And and it's great. I, I sincerely say this, that it's great that the Jockey Club and all these other uh, established you know organizations are getting behind this. Um, but there was one name here other than Churchill Downs um, that was missing. And that was PETA. You know, the ASPCA is in here, and they're saying it's great. Humane Society, the Animal Welfare Welfare Institute, all those organizations are behind it. Where is PETA? Because right now, you know, they're in meetings. They've, you know, orchestrated and and had all kinds of outside-the-racetrack protests. Shouldn't they be involved in this? Because they're already already involved. So shouldn't we get some kind of endorsement from them? and and I know, Bill, what you're saying is it ain't going to matter because we tried this in 2013. We tried this in 2000, you know, in 2004. And basically they couldn't get enough of, uh, you know, of, of a group behind it um, to really push it through. So maybe maybe it's whistling and, and, you know, past the graveyard. But to me, in a perfect world, it'd be great if we can get something like this together. I just I agree with Bill. I don't think it's going to happen. I think it'll be interesting to see who's called to testify. You hope it'll, it's. You know, there are certain people who probably aren't authorities, and just it'd be interesting to see who, who they actually call up there. Yeah, I mean, I kind of agree. I think something needs to be done. I don't know what exactly what the answer is, but I guess we know that this isn't going to happen according to Bill. So, I mean, <laughs> we'll well, according I can, to Gov Tracker, yes, yeah. through Bill, hey, never doubt Gov Tracker. Boys, no. just wanted to touch on Brian's point real quick. That's my why I'm. I'm trepidatious about right. these things is like that's not a word once that's you, not a word we'll look it up okay um right yeah that's a, i think trepid- it's a word you can have trepidations but you can't be trepidatious uh, i don't think but how how would you describe oh, you know sh- uh, stop this okay. no, no nobody cares okay uh, but the reason i i am trepidatious i'm gonna go with it um is the more politicians you get involved with yeah, this right. The less the the less the actual uh, solution that you're looking for becomes, you know, the more murky it becomes because you know if you read some of these quotes from Diane Feinstein about Santa Anita, she has no idea what's going on in racing. It's just political grandstanding. So I think once you get the feds involved with this, then the actual process that you're trying to execute to find a better solution becomes lost because everybody's got their own electoral motivations. And we drone on about something that we shouldn't be talking about and talking about why we shouldn't be talking about it. <laughs> but John, I can answer one of your questions uh, through the majesty, um, uh, the magnificent world of Google and smartphones. PETA supports the bill, which would put the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency in charge of drug oversight, blah, blah, blah. H.R. 1754 offers a chance to reduce breakdowns and deaths of horses who have no say in whether they race or not. Excellent. So well, then, well, then I was wrong on two, on yeah. two fronts. Mm-hmm. Because, I, got, I got the Oxford <laughs> Dictionary because PETA wasn't Don't there worry. exactly. Yeah. So, so I, I will be uh, ruled off for next week, obviously, because of uh, that's two strikes. Yep. Don't ever doubt me when my, my, my grasp of the English language, topsy turvy. Topsy turvy. That's, uh, that's going to be in the Oxford Dictionary next year. Do I have year. to look up now to see if trepidatious is actually a word? We just did. We just did. We just did. We just did. No, Bill, Bill's just piling on because yeah. I said a younger Bill, uh-huh. a younger, better looking Bill was, was going to yell to the future. Oh, man. Careful there. This story builds on last year's announcement that they were banning bisphosphonates from the three major sales houses in racing. Uh, came out yesterday that they would ban NSAIDs from horses that were going through the auction houses at Facing Tipton, Ocala, Breeders' Sales, and Keeneland. And they also are stri- more strictly regulating whip usage. I think the rule is that now you can strike the horse once behind the girth before the breeze starts, and then after that, it's only tapping basically on the shoulder unless the horse tries to bear out and bolt and all that stuff, and then you can do it a little you, – you can be a little more assertive. Um, I defer to the two gentlemen to my left who are involved in ownership and, and, and being at these sales. How big of an impact do you guys think this has? Let me start with the, with the pros and cons. Um, so basically, I applaud – the uh, you know the organization of trying to get some kind of universal rules we mentioned that before it's a great initial step um, addressing medication rules whether it's for racing or for sales ultra important 
great that all three of the major sales companies are in agreement and they want to have uniformity of rules and that they're going to have medication testing and it's straightforward. All really, really good ideas. That being said, I think it's BS because you're basically going to say to, to a rider, you can't use the, the riding crop, the whip, okay? Let's call it what it is. It's, it's a whip. Um, and, you know, except for in these certain terms. Well, it's still objective. Who's going to be sitting there and policing this and monitoring whether or not an exercise rider who gets $50 to, to ride a horse, you know, for a furlong and a half down the racetrack, um, whether or not he or she, you know, used the, the whip properly. What are the actual penalties? And, th- you know, because it says that the consigners are going to pay the penalties. But again, let's say that the, the, the rider incorrectly uses the, the crop whip um, and whips his horse and the horse goes an extra fifth of a second faster. Well, it's great if they're going to find the consigners $500 or $1,000 when all of a sudden that horse went a fifth of a second faster and that equated to $25,000, $50,000, $100,000 more in their pocket um, because it went faster than everybody else. So it, it, to me, it's a joke to have the consigner pay unless the fines are going to be you know, in excess of five or six figures, which will never happen. And the reason why I don't think that'll ever happen is because OBS in particular is owned by shareholders. The shareholders in particular are the breeders in the area and mostly the consigners in the area. And are you going to say to whoever the the objective police are going to be, they're going to say to an Eddie Woods or a Kieran Dunn or a Doc Eisman or a a Demerick family, hey, we think that your your rider incorrectly used the, the, the whip down the stretch and therefore we're going to fine you, okay? And that shareholder is then going to say, I sell $10, $15 million worth of horses through you every single year, and I'm a shareholder. Go suck it. <laughs> Try to see if you're going to find me. So, you know, again, it's great in a perfect world that they're putting these plans up there to say that, that here are the rules going forward. But in reality, I don't see how they're going to be able to police it and monitor it and ultimately, most importantly, impact the consigners to the point where they're going to outlaw this within their, you know, within their own organization. To me, it's simpler just to just take the whip out of the hands of the rider. And I know people say, well, it's there for their, for their safety. And what if a horse bolts and everything like that? I've spoken to enough riders and I've spoken to enough people that I trust in the industry. They get on horseback and in all intents and purposes, if a 1200 pound animal going 30 miles an hour wants to make a right-hand turn, a whip ain't going to stop them. I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> I definitely, I I would totally be in favor of no whips. I think I agree with what you're saying. How do you feel about, I, a couple after this came out, a couple of people were talking about it on Twitter. How do you feel about no actual breezes at two-year-old sales and only gallops? You know, they, they tried, a couple of consigners actually tried to do that. The right. Stronex tried to do it. They actually had yeah, a whole yeah, sale right. where, where they just galloped horses. John Phillips did it as John well. John Phillips right? did yeah. it as well. Exactly and right. Kirkwood. And Kirkwood. Yeah, yep, Kirkwood. Exactly. has been doing it. Are you guys yep. reading my notes? <laughs> exactly. You're exactly right. Yeah. And, and you know, having talked to Kip Elser um, personally about it, he felt like, you know, some of his owners wanted to go the route of galloping. Um, and it, I believe it's, it's public record where he said it almost bankrupted him. Because if he's the only one doing right. it and everyone else is following by different rules, then it's impossible to, to, to win that uphill battle. That being said, if they got rid of it for everybody right. universally, it would change the paradigm of, of completely. Well, that was the other thing. There were, a few years ago, there was all this talk about gallop outs and certain consigners would push their horses around the turn and certain ones wouldn't. And you know, some came out and said, we're not going to have them gallop out anymore. And, and I mean, I think more horses get bought, especially the higher end horses, based on the gallop outs and the actual breezes. So I think people probably realized they had to, you know, they had to have them gallop out. There's no question. I can tell you honestly that when we have people shortlist for us, everyone and their brother has a stopwatch. Right. And they're hitting it twice. They're hitting it once when they hit the wire, and they're hitting it once again a furlong after the wire. Right. Um, and that's how we ended up with a couple of horses that, that we're racing right now. It wasn't because of necessarily their breeze show. It was the post-breeze. Right. I think from my perspective, I'd love if there were no breezes and, you know, it, buying less expensive horses, I mean, when some horse goes work goes and works nine and three, everyone sees it. It's obvious. But I think people will still line up. If if they didn't have breezes, which obviously isn't what we're talking about, people would still line up for the curlin who's looks beautiful and gobs great and all that. I agree that step in the right direction. I think the medication stuff is is a no brainer. That's what I wanted to follow up on because we had Ty Pletcher on and we had Mark Taylor on a couple of weeks ago and they talked at length about some of the unnatural things that horses are made to do at a very young age. Um, and some of it is corrective surgeries and such. 
do you guys think that these kind of medication reforms, especially for very young horses, could make an impact in that way? Yeah, I don't think that the medication rules are really changing that much compared to what's already in the uh, in the terms and agreements of, of oh, excuse me, the terms and conditions of, of the catalog. Um, I, I think they're just making it uniform across all of the sales companies, which, which is good. Um, that being said, having been active over the past number of years of buying two-year-olds, the option is always there when you sign the ticket. And Brian, you know right. this as well as I do. When you sign the ticket saying you're going to buy the horse, you check a box saying whether or not you want to have post-sale drug testing. Right, okay. you, you pay the five hundred. You pay the five hundred dollars <laughs> to do it, and then you have to wait a week for the for the results, and and then you get the results. Meanwhile, the horse at the fall of the hammer technically is your asset. So if anything happens in that week and the results come back negative, um, then you know if the horse something happens to the horse, it's it's on you. Okay, so it's a it's a really murky kind of situation. The other thing I would tell you is again talking to consigners, the the medications that they're putting horses or they're they're putting into horses pre breeze are basically out of their system by the time they get into the sales ring. Because the way these breeze shows are set up now, the breeze shows are usually about a week to or five days to a week before when they're actually going to go into the sales ring. So by the time you're drawing blood, again, most of those most of those uh, medications are, are out of their system. I'd be curious to know if a horse has ever tested positive for, I'm sure they're, I've only heard of one. There are, and, and, I doubt there are many. It was, yeah, and, and I don't even think they turned the horse back because right. I think it was the kind of thing where it was such a nominal amount. Right. Um, but that's it, that may be folklore, uh, mm-hmm. you know, as far as I'm concerned. But for all intents and purposes, I, I would guess that it's probably you know two or three percent of all the people who buy horses actually post drug test their I never, horses. It's, I mean, for us, it's five hundred five hundred dollars means something. But yeah. Uh, yeah, and I'm with you. Absolutely. One, one other thing about the the breeze shows. I'm 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 stunned that they still do it by fifths of a second. Is there a reason for that? Because it seems like Brian was saying how big of a difference there can be between nine and four and ten, um, and every other track basically has gone to a hundredths when they used to do fifths of a second for fractional times. Is there a reason that they're still doing flat fifths of a second? None that I can think of, other than the fact that the way they have their toe boards set up yeah. are all still based on fifth of. Uh, but it, they do it at FASIC too. They do it at FASIC oh, tipped in. Like they they, do, I have never seen a pre show where they do a hundredths of a yeah. second. The only thing I can think of is just because it, it, you you would think you'd want to get it as precise as possible and yeah. get to hundredths of a second. Um, but in reality, if you start doing that, then you're you're drawing horses away from the top. Right. If if you had a horse that if the fastest time was ten seconds and you had a group of horses that went. 10 and 2, and then you kind of delineated it after, and, and you, you know, you've showed that it was really 10.3, some of them went 10.39, and some of them went 10.2, well, then you're furthering those horses from the top. I think it's better for the sales company and for the consigners, the more horses you have closer to that fastest time than further away. That's the only thing I can think of. Yeah. I feel like it can work the other way, too. Like, if you work 10.21, and another horse, another horse works ten point three nine. Those are two completely different breezes. And if you're an unlucky one to do ten point three nine, I mean, I mean, if you if you were ten point two one, you you're lumped in the same ten and one uh, subset. This week's news was sponsored by West Point Thoroughbreds. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership is one of the most affordable, smart, and fun ways for new owners to enjoy all the fun of being an insider in an entirely new world for a fraction of the cost. Check us out at westpointtb.com. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With more than 500 clients in the horse business, they were bred to save you money. For more information on how they can help you, visit www.greenco.com. So for this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, we welcome in the VP of Racing Operations at Gulfstream Park. Big week at Gulfstream Park with the Pegasus World Cup coming in. Mike Lakow. Mike, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Um, so I will start at the top. The biggest news about the about the Pegasus before this week um, was the purse reduction because it started at twelve million, then it was sixteen million the second year. Last year, I believe it was sixteen million, but it was split because they had the turf. You had the turf race um, at the advent of the turf race. This year, it's three million for the Pegasus World Cup, and then one million for the turf race. Can you talk about the process and the thinking behind the purse reduction, and whether or not you see that as the way it'll be structured going forward? Well, I can't predict the future. Uh, with the with the new purse distribution and the purses themselves, uh, we have full fields. The horsemen were uh, very supportive of uh, the changes. And keep in mind, when they the purses were that high, the the horsemen were paying a half a million, four hundred thousand to run in these races. Where this year it's free. There's no charge. It's a, a true invitational. 
Uh, so the horses enter and run for no for no fees. And uh, we've structured it as well where graded stakes horses um, make some money uh, when they finish sixth through tenth. And then the majority of the money is, of course, split one through five with two percent of the rest going to thoroughbred aftercare, which is so important. Mike, it's Bill Finley, and thanks for joining us uh, today. Uh, staying on the same topic of changes to the Pegasus World Cup, there is no medication allowed, race day medication or allowed Lasix. I applaud you as an anti-Lasix guy going back many, many years. But at the same time, I wonder if that made it more difficult to get horses into the race. So take us through the, the thinking of going drug-free for this race. Bill, I, I got to tell you, I, I, I'm surprised how... I'm not going to say easy it was, but uh, it wasn't as big an issue as you would think. Uh, when I first started working for Gulfstream, it was, my first day was October 1st. And when I accepted the position, I'm thinking, OK, I'm going to start on these Pegasus races because I know it's a lot of work to have full fields and to have uh, trainers focus on those races, especially when their owners are paying so much money to run. And uh, the change happened late. There's no doubt about it. And um, you know, it, it caught me by surprise, uh, but I, you know, I stuck to it. I made a list of every graded stake uh, horse in the country, both grade wins and grade placed, and I just started calling. And there, the non Lasix for me was not an issue. We may have lost one horse here and there that really didn't need to be in the race, but basically, I would say 95% of the horsemen trainers said my horse really doesn't need Lasix, and we're in. Mike, it's uh, John Green from DJ Stable. It was a pleasure to talk to you, and thanks for coming on. Um, My pleasure. And, and one of the questions I have for you with regard to some changes that you've implemented since your time on October 1st, um, again, I know from managing a stable and trying to get races to go, uh, one of the positive things that I think you've done was reduce the, 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 the number of races per day from, you know, from 14 down to about 10 or 11 on, on the weekends, um, which allows us to have a better idea of, you know, what races are coming up in the book, how to get our horses training for a specific date. Um, and it makes it easier, again, from a manager standpoint. So I, I applaud that. What other changes um, either have you implemented or are planning on implementing um, with regard to Gulfstream for the upcoming meet? You know what, I'm still feeling through the meet. Uh, what we changed also was Gulfstream in the past was running 14 horse fields for the cheaper races for actually any race that got that large of um, a field. And I felt after 12, we didn't need those other horses. And, you know, there's safety issues now as well. So I felt 12 would be the max. Now, with that being said, uh, on Saturday's card, the Fred Hooper is older horses one mile. And it's a great stake and they start way back in the long run into the first turn. So we do have 14 horses running that race, but it's not the seven and a half on the turf going into the first turn where we're not going to card more than 12. Uh, we're trying to make the better races. And my feeling is we have to develop horses here and we'll use those races. If we get six, occasionally we'll use a five horse field because it, it's fair for the trainers, the horsemen, the owners that are paying the bills to, again, support those races so they can take the next step at the next level. And it's been successful. Yeah, you know, we've run some small fields. Uh, the handle doesn't hit, get hit too much. And then we have another horse for the uh, next level of races. Hi, Mike. This is Brian DiDonato. How are you? Good. Uh, back to the Pegasus races. How much have you tried to um, attract foreign Horses. I think there's one uh, European-based horse. Uh, obviously, Naira and the Breeders' Cup have made that a priority. Is that a priority of, of your guys as well? Yeah, you know, I, I think the time of the year isn't optimal. Uh, with that, you know, Brian did send two over. One filly is running in the La Praviante, and then, of course, we have Magic Wand and the Pegasus. We wanted to, we were focused on a Japanese horse, or a couple of Japanese horses as well, and it just didn't pan out. But we're going to keep trying to have uh, international support. And uh, this year we have one, so we didn't, uh, we didn't strike out. But I, I think it's, it, it's good for racing, good for the fans, and it promotes Gulfstream Park throughout the world.
Hey, Mike, Joe Bianca again. Um, there was a story about Gulfstream West in the fall that they had a breakdown free meet, I believe, and that Gulfstream's had a pretty good safety record so far. Can you talk about what safety protocols you guys have instituted at Gulfstream and what you might be looking to do going forward? Well, I'll tell you what, I owe a lot of credit to our track superintendent, Tony Martinez. He's the guy that understands both the turf and the dirt. He specializes in the dirt. Uh, he has some of his crew are actually exercise riders in the morning. So he has firsthand knowledge of what the track needs. And uh, he's here every day. He's at Palm Meadows and Gulfstream Park and, of course, Gulfstream Park West. Uh, Tony has his ideas. I don't want to interfere, but they seem to be working beautifully. And I'm going to give all the credit to Tony and his staff. Mike, it's Bill. Let's stay at Gulfstream Park West because I also have a question about that. There have been reports on and off that, of all things, uh, Churchill Downs, which owns Gulfstream Park West and then you lease it out for the racing, wants to put in a high life front on there, which I believe would excuse them from having to run any horse racing there whatsoever. Uh, Gulfstream Park is pretty maxed out at 10 months a year. What's going to happen going forward with uh, Gulfstream Park West? And if, if you're forced to, will you just run 12 months a year at Gulfstream? That's in discussion. Uh, I don't know if I doubt we could run 12 months a year on our turf course. It does need a break. Uh, and there's we're trying to put together as many options as we can. Uh, my understanding is Gulfstream Park West last year will be this upcoming year. We plan on building stalls at Palm Meadows and a very large dorm room as well. Everything is right now in the works. I, I really can't comment. Uh, we're still throwing ideas around and, uh, you know, we'd like to certainly race 12 months a year in South Florida. It, it's John Green again. Just a, a question for you regarding something I think that's near and dear to your heart, and that's the um, the horse aftercare programs. You were the president and CEO of the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation, so it's something that that I know you have a real passion for. Can you just give the uh, the listeners just an idea of uh, some of the other programs that you support? Well, track is uh, based out of Gulfstream Park, and there's a percentage of the handle that goes to track, and track is also part of the Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance, and you're right. Uh, I, I spent a few years with the, with the TRF, and I think it, it needs to be important with every owner, trainer, fan. It's so important. And with the TAA, they're they're developing new options, and um, we just got have to keep going. And uh, you know, the, the horse population is down, which helps a little bit. But uh, these horses need to be cared for, and everybody at Gulfstream I know is 100% in on, on helping the horses. And Mike, I know that um, at, at Naira and I think at Oakland this year they introduced a little aftercare fee on claims. Is that something you guys do currently or have considered? We have not done that. I have considered it, though. Uh, I think the, the championship meet was the wrong time to start. But again, that's another thing that's in discussion. Uh, I just want to go back to the Pegasus for a second. You mentioned it being in a difficult point in the schedule, not too long after most horses have concluded their year at the Breeders' Cup. You also have the advent of the Saudi Cup this year, which acts, I, I would think, as some kind of competition. Does that does that affect the planning of the Pegasus going forward in terms of either purse levels or moving the date around potentially? Well, I don't think it's affecting the purse levels, but uh, again, I'm not I'm not creating that purse. But Linda Stronach, it's it's uh, she's writing a check for both purses, so it's her call. I think we're going to have an incredible day Saturday. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the overnight; it's not out yet, but uh, you know, we have 135 horses entered and nine stakes races, and they're basically full fields. Uh, with the Saudi Cup, it's five weeks past the pace this race is that too close well i don't know i i i i grew up in racing where you needed two weeks two and a half weeks for good horses to run i remember riding allowance races two weeks apart two and a half weeks apart and all the horses kept running so times have changed uh with that being said i am thinking about possibly having it a week even two weeks earlier in the year and for two reasons a saudi cup if it stays uh, it gives horses more time. And also, I was thinking, if horses have one more shot for the big money, a big race, uh, and then they're going to stud, it would give them time to run, settle at the farm, and just relax before they start breeding. So I think maybe in a week on that end would help that as well. 
Mike, it's Bill again, and uh, I'm going to throw you a big fat softball right over the middle of the plate and knock this one out of the park, my friend. Handle is up 17% or $24.5 million as of the beginning of this week. And every single year, you look at Gulfstream and think it's reached a peak. It can't continue to grow, yet it does. You know, what's your answer for that, that why even going against huge figures from last year, you guys are up so much? Well, I think the industry industry is doing very well. Uh, we've had good weather, Bill, and I'm not gonna, I'm not walking around with my chest out. I mean, right now, we've had minimal rain. We had a, quite a bit in December. January has been good, so we're up against races days where races came off the turf. Uh, with that said, we're running less cheap races. A lot of the claiming 62.5 horses are no longer here. I remember past years, again, I wasn't working at Gulfstream. I was working at Aqueduct the past few years or Jockey Agent before that. Uh, they were splitting $6,250 turf races every day, it, it, it seemed like. And if you look closely at our cards, we don't have the 100 to 1 shots right, that are running up the track every single start. Uh, protocols have been set where if a horse doesn't finish one through four for a minimum amount in the lesser races, they're no longer eligible. And I think that's worked for us. Now, it, it, it keeps the racing office open, trying to fill entries each day. But uh, I think it, it, it quality is important and, and consistency in these horses. And again, you know, you may see some horses at high odds, but, but we really want to get competitive racing here. And we've also, you know, again, we, we have to change with the times. We dropped, we were supposed to race today, actually. And I went to management and said, hey, listen, you know, six days a week, this industry it, it is impossible to have quality, productive cards as six days a week. And they understand. They said, no problem. Uh, and again, it was brought up earlier in our conversation that we ran 13 races, 14 races occasionally. And we're not doing that. We're running 12 on Saturdays, 11 on Sundays, if we can fill. One Wednesday, we ran nine. Uh, is, it, is it uncomfortable? Rather than ten races, is it uncomfortable? Yeah, it's uncomfortable, but we're we're not uh, we're doing what's needed to give quality to the fans. Thanks so much for the time, Mike, and and best of luck this weekend. Great stuff. Yeah, we're gonna need luck. We're gonna need weather. Thanks, <laughs> right. I appreciate it. All Thanks, right. Mike. Thanks, Thanks, Mike. All right, take care. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As The Green Group Guest of the Week, Mike Lakow will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. The Green Group, bred to save you money. For more information on how they can help you, visit www.greenco.com. So you just heard from Mike Lakow, um, our intrepid reporter, Bill Finley, had some thoughts following up on that interview and about the Pegasus' future, take it away. Well, I think the most interesting thing Mike said was they may move the date of the race. And they picked this weekend because it's a perfect weekend between the NFL championship games and the Super Bowl. So there's really from competition from other sports that they get a, you know, somewhat of the limelight and spotlight all to themselves. But they're going to need to start thinking about things like this because, you know, we've got to be honest about this. This year the Pegasus was a mess, somewhat of a mess, I'll be fair. Uh, you know, all of a sudden it went in the clear blue sky from $9 million owed to $3 million, and no, you don't have to put up any money to get in, and oh, you can't use Lasix and everything. But I actually think that they've settled on the right formula, because the problem with the old formula was, and the old formula being where people had to pay a boatload of money to make their horses eligible for the race uh, in the first year, a uh, million dollars, is that if you're gun runner and you're going to be four to five in the race or even money or arrogate that's fine but who with a 25 to one shot would ever do that that's the world's worst bet and they were trying to get 12 horse fields with this format it just didn't work to me and you know i don't know what they did behind the scenes but i bet you they told a lot of guys hey you know hush hush we'll let you in for like you know cut rate or something like that so then you add the saudi cup as competition for it a 20 million dollar race going up against a you know, whatever, $9 million race, then down to a $3 million race. That was obviously going to cause problems too. So this race isn't nearly as sexy at $3 million as it was when it was $9 million or whatever the purses were in other years. That's to be understood. But I think this going forward is the right format and the format that they'll have the most success off of. And yes, moving the race uh, back a couple weeks in the calendar or, or up a couple weeks on the calendar might make people more willing to go Gulfstream Saudi Cup. It was one of those things where they, when they announced it, when they first announced it, I was blown away at the purse levels. And I just, 
it didn't seem sustainable at the time. I thought it would last longer than a year or two, but it just it seemed like something intended to make a big splash in the media that wasn't really going to stick around because it was just unsustainable. Like Bill says, you know, if if you're a long shot, if you're any kind of long shot, why would you buy in for a million dollars into this race when there's a bunch of other races? Unless you're Ron Paolucci. Right. Yeah, he's the, he's the, uh, the exception of the rule. But uh, I do think it is important for Gulfstream to have this kind of centerpiece day because it is the the home to all pretty much all quality winter racing. I know Brian will argue with me and say Oakland, and Oakland's a good has a good meet too. But you know most of the attention for the winter is on Gulfstream, and I just don't I don't get excited about the Florida Derby. You know, what I mean, first of all, it's way at the end of the meet, and there's a bunch of other Derby preps going on. So I think it is cool and it is interesting, especially in the dead of winter when a lot of pe- a lot of snowbirds are down there to have that kind of centerpiece day to build the entire meet around. And I think now that it has a sustainable purse level. I think I think it makes a lot more sense. And are you saying that Gulfstream Park is the pinnacle of, of winter racing because Mountaineer's not running in the wintertime? Is that basically the, the parenthetic story behind all this? I don't know anything else about Mountaineer after what you Jeez. told me. I might get some people mad at me. End up in a dump. Well, you know, they did have – well, I'm not even going to go there about, about the bodies they found. But anyway, go ahead, Brian. I remember Don Day being a pretty exciting bit. Obviously, it's not the Pegasus Day, but we, like you said, we kind of started so high and we with this grand idea and now we're, we've – settled here but i think it's still an exciting day and I, I agree i don't know how you could be have the 12th most likely winner of the race and pay a million dollars i think it'd be interesting if they figured out a way to base how much you had to buy in based on odds but obviously that would you know if you had the even money favorite and you had to put up three million i'm sure no one would want, would want to do that either right but, um, and basically if you're looking at the calendar um, of events at, at Gulfstream park if they push it back two weeks to make it in this year it would be the 11th you're only up against the you know two grade three races, which for a Saturday or Sunday at Gulfstream is kind of the, the norm. They seem to have a couple of stake races every day. So from a timing standpoint, it makes a ton of sense. And you know we didn't even get into Mike's background, but one of the things that Mike was doing at one point was he was um, you know with Hillendale. And they've been very aggressive with buying stallions. So he understands the timing and the importance of, you know, when to get a horse in there and when they need to have open houses. If they could have the races be, uh, you know, maybe even the week before the Keeneland sale, then all of a sudden people who are buying mares, you know, at the Keeneland January sale are then looking to, oh, now we can breed to the Pegasus winner or the Pegasus turf winner because we know that he will be here in Kentucky in a week. I think even maybe moving it back further into into December might be interesting in terms of the championship discussion because after the Breeders' Cup, there's so few big races that you can run in. There's basically the Clark, the Cigar Mile, and the Malibu. I think those are the only three major grade one races. So I think even maybe moving it back further so that if you are do need to make up a little bit of ground in the championship hunt, then you can go to the Pegasus. But that's just an idea. The other thing I wanted to say is that I went down to cover the Pegasus a couple of years ago, and it actually made a dent in terms of like the Miami event nightlife. And Miami is the kind of city where it's all about events and it's all about these big productions. And I know people hate when they when they add all these accoutrements to a day at the races, you know, whether it's a concert or something like that. But I think in that city, it actually makes sense in order to try to kind of, you know, get into that. I guess a niche in in terms of like the greater scheme, the greater scope of Miami and Miami nightlife. The Pegasus makes a lot of it makes a dent when it was the Don and the Florida Derby. I don't think that ever really was the case, even if it's only for one day. Just to have your day on the calendar in Miami, I think, is a big deal for racing. I think one thing it might conflict a little bit with, and maybe in most years this doesn't matter, but it's opening day at Santa Anita, you know, Omaha Beach might have had to make a decision one race or or the other. Uh, Probably doesn't come up often, but something I think the Toronto group's probably thinking about. Yeah. Did they ever say anything about Gulfstream Park um, putting a bid in for the Breeders' Cup? No, I haven't heard anything about Be- that. Because you would think that – I probably should have asked Mike this, but you'd think that if, if they eventually are going to try to get back in the swing of of, um, of being on the calendar for the Breeders' Cup, if they had the Breeders' Cup – you know, the, the first or second week in November, and then they knew they were going to have the Pegasus races six weeks later. Um, that would be such a natural, and everyone would just leave their horses at, at Gulfstream Park yeah. at that point. John, I don't think that facility can handle a Breeders' Cup. You're probably I really right. Don't. I, probably I mean, right. It's, it's so small. I mean, it's got great restaurants and everything. It's, it's a, a, a racetrack that has broke the norm of what a racetrack is supposed to be. But, I mean, how many, those few seats they have facing the track in the grandstand, probably about 
thousand seats or something. Um, now you could put up temporary bleachers and things like that. But, you know, the old golf stream was wonderful for the um, Breeders' Cup. You know, there are a lot of things to like about the new golf stream, but clearly I, I don't think that facility could handle it. And I, I don't think the Breeders' Cup is going to try something there. I always say that it, golf stream to me looks like if they made a, if they built a track in Vegas, you know, with with the casino and, and with the mall and all the restaurants and all, it seems like that would be what it looked like. And I agree that in terms of accommodating fans, it's, it's not the ideal destination for the Breeders' Cup. But are we doing it for the fans? I mean, you know. <laughs> we have to. We're the, without the fans, we are nothing. That is true. Um, and the fans like them some Post Malone. That's what I learned when I went <laughs> down there. So we're going to tie in. We love our tie-ins here at the TDN Writers' Room. We're going to tie in to some content from this week in the TDN publication, uh, we started a new series focused on people that did not grow up in racing families and how they got hooked on racing. Some guy did one yesterday that I really didn't care for, but <laughs> I've, most of them have been pretty good. Um, so th the first question is, how did you get hooked on racing? But the second question, I think the more loaded question is, would you commit to converting one person to be a horse racing, either fan or gambler this year? And if so, how would you do it? Uh, I'm going to toss that grenade over to Bill first and let him deal with it. Well, one of the things that you're going to read over and over and over again in this TDN thing is, oh, let's take people to Saratoga. Let's take people to the Breeders' Cup. Let's take them to opening day at Del Mar. That's all well and good, and they are great experiences, but we don't need fans. We need betters. And uh, in the uh, Thoroughbred Idea Foundation had a great line when Craig Burnick put out um, a kind of a white paper type thing. Uh, wasn't that extensive, but put out a statement about um, the marketing efforts in racing. He says, essentially said, I'm tired of seeing all the marketing efforts devoted to uh, uh, young kids in bow ties and, and girls in sundresses. And so what would I do? I, I would sit them down in front of the racing form. And, you know, give them a mythical $100 or something. Or, you know, take them to Las Vegas and enter a, a, a tournament with somebody like that. Because, you know, it's all well and fine to have these, you know, very good-looking people show up, um, you know, for things like the Breeders' Cup and whatnot. But they're not coming back the next day. They're not coming back for any other day. So I, I think that you can only accomplish so much by exposing these people to, you know, the obvious things, Del Mar, Saratoga, Breeders' Cup, et cetera, um, you know, you, why don't you expose them to a Thursday at Hawthorne? <laughs> you, you know, that's really, unfortunately, what racing is all about. That's 99% of racing. 1% is, you know, all these glamour things and big event days. So I would take an exact opposite approach is how not to get them hooked on horse racing, how to get them hooked on gambling on horse racing. I think I've said this before on the podcast. I don't think I would ever tell a new person to gamble on horse Thank racing. Thank you. Thank God you said not it. Not in a, like... You have to be a total sucker. Like it's a it's an affliction for us at this point. We're just stuck with it. We're right. Like, yeah. Exactly. We're, we're in too deep. But I, someone who you know, someone who's maybe good with numbers, a young person interested in, you know, sports and all that. I would tell them go learn daily fantasy or go play poker. Anything but this. If, if it's just about the gambling, until takeout is half of what it is, and all these other things are fixed, I would never tell anyone to bet on a horse race. I I think the uh, problem that racing has too, not just the takeout is that we were talking about this a little bit when we were talking about sports betting is that the, the the barrier to entry in terms of feeling like you have enough of an idea to make a bet is much lower in sports because right. it's a bigger part of our culture racing it's like you look at the racing form and all of us know it like at the back of our hands but if you don't it's, it looks like hieroglyphics so the idea that I would sit someone down and like try to train them for months in, in terms of how to read the racing form just to go bet a 25% pick four. I just, right. I wouldn't do that to anybody I love. <laughs> and the other thing is, you know, I, I mentioned in, in my article that, you know, I try to get people to understand and have a love for the horse. And that's really taking the angle of you want to love the athlete and you want to love the sport because that's going to, you know, force you to make decisions from a business standpoint or from a personal standpoint about what to do with that horse. Um, you know, do I inject it and, and drop it down? Do I let somebody else, let it be somebody else's problem? Or do I, you know, do something proactive, try to have a home for the horse, um, you know, upon its, its retirement. And it, it's gotta be where you love the sport. Um, and then that begets, the fans, which begets, you know, maybe they'll bet on the horse, but more importantly, 
they're going to start to fill in that middle ground that we're seeing a lack of at these sales. You see everyone who's in the business right now, everyone, a lot of people who are in the business right now uh, want to buy the shiny new toy and they want to have the expensive, you know, new sire, um, or they want to have a son or daughter of Carlin and run it in the Breeders Cup. And like Bill alluded to, um, you know, or actually outright said they want to be in the spotlight on those certain Saturdays. But in reality, most of the races, as we said, are, are in the claiming, you know, claiming ranks and the, the lower allowance races, but people aren't destined to go out to a sale to buy those type of horses. So the middle market is continuing to get skewed. Um, and we need people to fill in to that middle market. You need people who are going to buy the twenty five to $50,000 horses um, to fill the races on Thursdays at, at, uh, you know, at the various racetracks. Um, so to me, it's got to be I love the sport. I love the athlete. I love the feeling because you're right, Bill. You're not. Nobody's going to want to go to Aqueduct on a Thursday afternoon to try to bet the fifth race. Um, it, it's just that's not what we're trying to sell in this business. Um, I think we're trying to sell the idea of owning a piece of sports um, because none of us can afford to buy the Yankees or the Giants or the, who would want the Rangers, but or the or the Rangers. Um, <laughs> we, but we're coming, man. It, it's the best way to own a piece of sports, and it's an, a quote unquote affordable way to own a piece of sports and to have your name out there and your colors and kind of pride ownership. Just to follow up on that point, that's why I think it is important for, you know, Brian is doing this and there are a lot of other, I did a story a couple of years ago on the Nexus Racing Club, which is a bunch of young women who started an ownership group where they don't actually have an equity stake in the horse, but they get all the other benefits. They get to go to the backstretch, they get to go see them work out, they get to go to the winner's circle. That to me is the best entree in terms of getting people to dip their toe in and then eventually get them hooked. And Brian's partnership is doing well. There's lots of other partnerships. And I think the more you can spread out the ownership in this industry, I think the better chance you have, not just of them getting into racing, but then their children, their children's children, because it is something that gets passed on through lineage and, and familial traditions. Now, after both Brian and John B-I-T-C-H slapped me on my idea, you know, Brian, oh, gambling on horse racing. Jeez, that's the <laughs> stupidest thing in the world. Um, but uh, John, it might not be the case with you because you're, you're involved so much on the ownership side, but I bet you, I know how I got interested in horse racing. I bet you the same thing for, oh, yeah, for you too. 95% of the people who are horse racing fans or participate in horse racing, why did they become horse racing fans? Because they cashed a bet. And they cashed a bet right at the beginning. This is a true story. I started going to the track with my father when I was seven years old. And I bet two to show on the favorite at Garden, the old Garden State. And I don't know how I remember this. And it, it may not be true. But I, in the back of my mind, I believe I won the first 11 times I ever went to the racetrack, which is the worst thing that ever happened to me. It destroyed ruined right. my life going forward. <laughs> Big but, deal. You're a show better. Yeah. I can do that. Well, I mean, but that's huge money for a seven-year-old, yeah. you know, two to show on, on the six to five shot ridden by Walter Blum at Garden State. Um, and I parlayed him. Yeah, Come right. On. So if you go down the, the, the ranks of people who are into this sport and are real fans, I guarantee you, the vast majority of them, if you ask them, how'd you get interested in horse racing? All have the same answer. Oh, on this day, I cashed a bet. Pick four, maybe two to show on, on you know, Walter Blum at six to five in, in 1974 or whatever at, at Garden State. But that's the answer you're going to get more often than any other. And I don't think you're going to get a lot of people say, oh, you know, I put on my seersucker suit and my bow tie <laughs> and went out to the Breeders' Cup with, uh, you know, my attractive uh, girlfriend was wearing a sundress, you know. <laughs> I think so are, you, are, you saying, are you saying that you're anti having you're, you're against having good looking people come to the races? Yeah, I'll leave. Okay, okay. I just want to make sure I, that Absolutely. I understood the message. Yes. That was the that's message. part of the Horse Racing Integrity Act too. <laughs> <laughs> Only ugly people. If you read the fine print, and that's maybe why I can't go anywhere. That's why we're all there. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Bill's marketing campaign and just a bunch of dude with dudes with eye patches and like all yeah. these it's disheveled stars. guys. Well, come it's on better, out to the track. It's better than Brian basically taking the backbone of our sport and what it says this is a crock of you know what I, well, don't bet on these me, things I, I bet probably as much as anyone in this room maybe not Joe but one of us <laughs> and we're probably not even I'm fully invested in horse racing in every possible way and and, and I still feel like I'm a sucker every time I place a bet. Yeah. I To uh, so Bill's point, I, my first real memory with racing was the 2003 Derby. I cashed the ticket with Funny Side on top. And I was 16 years old and it paid 600 bucks, which when you're 16, like 600 thought, bucks what is an easy all game the money in the world. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I simultaneously, I off and on either like look to that day in glory or curse the day that yeah. I ever cashed that ticket. 
you need that kind of positive experience off the jump and gambling. Gambling can give you that little bug right, uh, right off the top. And too. I think horse racing should be the best. I think it's naturally the best gambling game by a large margin. It's just that we've destroyed it with in plenty of ways. But I think it, it should be the best kind of gambling and the truest form of gambling. But I, I think you, what you stopped short of saying, and we, we said this on, on the podcast before, and I agree with you, uh, is because you believe that the price of making a bet or the takeout is unreasonable. Correct. Yeah, that's a huge yeah. part of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and you don't see, as a, if you're a horse player, you don't really feel like your needs are responded to in the way that the industry should. Um, and that's not just takeout. That's in terms of like presentation and data and all this stuff that other more sophisticated gambling sports have at the ready. Well, just to jump in, also, how about the fact that that now I don't know if you guys realize this, but um, when you become a licensed owner in New Jersey, you get a letter from the offices of the state and it's co signed, I believe, if I remember correctly, it's co signed by Dennis Drazen, saying that as a licensed owner, you are forbidden from making bets oh, at God, New Jersey racetracks. It could it be anything more stupid than that. It, yeah. But but I'm just I'm yeah. just saying to you like you know, and New Jersey's the only state where I've ever seen that. Right. Um, and I know it's because of sports betting and everything like that. And they say that you have a that you could have a tangent, um, you know, effect on on what goes on. Um, but again, like like the whip down the down the stretch of a, of a two year old training sale, you know, what I tell a jockey, you know, it ain't gonna matter that much. Yeah, and it is interesting. Um, I I thought about this when tr all the tracks started to get slots, and the idea was that okay, you get more gamblers in the building, handle will go up. But the thing is, it's a very, it's such a different game in terms of just sitting there and mindlessly pulling a slot handle and really handicapping and getting like, there's so many things to know and so many things to study in racing. And there's, I'm, Brian will say this too, I'm sure you guys will all say this, that there is so many times where you lose, you have like a bad beat and you go back and you look at the form and you're like, oh, if only I had seen this, oh, if yeah. only I had seen this. But there's so many different factors. That's why it'll drive you crazy. But it is, it's a thinking man's game. And I think the, the, the typical gambler in America right now just wants to sit in front of a slot machine. And I think it's really hard to sell them on something that is a cerebral pursuit in the way that racing is, and especially one that'll kick you in the balls as much as betting on horse racing does. Should I spell it out? B-A-L-L-S. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's, it's hard to convert. It's much harder to convert those kind of bettors. And it's an interesting topic in terms of the uh, introduction of sports betting as well. And I think that's, I'd be interested, we might have uh, Dennis Drazen on in the near future. And I think he would be an interesting guy to talk to about in terms of the crossover between sports bettors and horse bettors. One other elephant in the room is obviously the safety issues and the bad press that racing has gotten. And it is, as we've spoken about, is it's an existential crisis. So you know, I don't think that we can have this discussion without mentioning that and the fact that there's a decent possibility in a couple of decades that the sport won't exist if it doesn't get its house in order. So that's another reason I would be hesitant to introduce people to the, the love of horse racing that I have is I don't know if it's going to be around for you, you know, when you really start to get good at it and really start to, you know, develop a passion for it like we have. Boy, Mr. Doom and Gloom here. My <laughs> we're goodness. The, we're the two young guys. Yeah, I mean, really. Exactly. How do you think? Yeah, what, what does that say? How do you think even the younger generation feels? <laughs> yeah. They don't know. All right. That's why I said it was a loaded question because I, I would like I like to be a positive advocate for racing in this space, but you also got to be a realist too. And it, it's just there, there are a lot of hurdles right now for racing to clear. I love how you had the humble brag of, oh, you know, I bet, I bet, I bet. And it's really a thinking man's betting game. <laughs> but it is, it is, I wish it weren't so much. Right. You know how many hours of my life I wish I had back from yeah. handicapping? Like, I just, yeah, it's it's Ooh. hard, man. It's hard. It's really something you really got to, like, rack your brain about in order to be good at it. And even then, it's no guarantee. Mm -hmm. So on those positive notes, we, uh, we're going to sign off for this week. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, Brian DiDonato, and our Green Group guest of the week, Mike Lakow. We will see you next week. 